so here we are with the lathe. All right, I just turned it on. Hit this night light switch. Let there be blinding light. Emergency stop. Pull this guy. Then you gotta hold the standby button for like five years. Cool. The pump then never shuts off. There's no eco mode, so that's kind of annoying. A, another annoying thing about this is when you do your initial a dish, your initial home reference, the turret moves down in X this way. So if you you might notice that if the B axis was maybe under the turret and something was here, it will actually hit the B axis. I've done that twice now. Fantastic, I know. You're telling me that it's a repeatable thing, so maybe I shouldn't have done that twice, but let me tell you, it's not really something you think about, but anyways, it only does it when you have it e-stopped and you clear the e-stop and then you reference. So this is what it looks like. See, it comes down. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, so I've jammed some tools into the sheet metal and I almost broke a tool yesterday. I'm hoping only two for the rest of my life on this machine. What we're working on is I made these, these jaws, see they're square, and we're working on the square spacers for the knife. So you're talking about a eighth diameter square, basically that I need to transfer and then cut and part, uh, or part and then whatever, you'll see. So you can imagine that the the tolerances in this, uh, this equation are pretty tight. The stop pins, I've done the same thing. I had to make smaller uh, subspindle jaws, but those work really good. So I'm hoping we can figure out how to do this on here. Basically what needs to happen is we need to orientate the subspindle to an orientation of 0 or 5 degrees, figure out where that ends, and then we need to align the main spindle so that, like, C0 is in line with uh, B axis 0. There is no, like, rotational code for this thing, it's just not an M code, but basically whatever this is at 0, then the main needs to be uh, in line for the square transfer. So I'm going to figure out how to do that, and then uh, we'll kind of continue on. But basically, this has taken me uh, a while just to get to this part, because as you can see, it was live It was live milled. That's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so this is the next big hurdle for getting a ton of knife spacers out on a lathe, but should be cool. Okay, so the first step in this equation is getting the subspindle to a repeatable uh, orientation. So to move the subspindle, to actually use the orientation of the subspindle, what I found is the subspindle has to be at its second home position. Now, in this machine, that's a settable thing. Uh, so it's a G30, I think, P2. So that was home reference 2. And in this case, the home reference is in front of our parts catcher. So that's just where I have it set. So what I'm going to do is call the subspindle to its second home, which should be right around here and make sure there's no tools it's going to hit, and then we'll type in the codes to get it to orientate, and uh, we'll go from there. So, you go to Program, MDI, and then we're going to do a, a G56, which is the offset that the B-axis uh, is second home, like, tied to, like, they're, to, they're the same. A G30 Shift P to shift B0 and then we're in the block and hit insert and that's our code here I'm gonna have the green button hopefully it doesn't go too fast okay and that is now at its second home position now you don't know that but if you look in the ladder diagram it'll actually show you it is now on its its second home position don't ask me how I figured this out it took me like a, a day or two and some help from other people but yeah it's kind of uh, stupid uh, next thing we need to call the subspindle and there's like there's two different codes and I'm not sure if they're both needed but M55 is the code that tells the subspindle like we're selecting the subspindle synchro which your guess is as good as mine what that actually means but that's what the that's what I have found uh, works 
So we're going to do N M55 end a block, and then what you can do is you, if you end a block and then you type something else in, it'll actually line it up on uh, different lines, which I found out yesterday. That's cool. Um, we're going to do an M300. Now, the way this works is M300 is subspindle orientation 0. M305 is subspindle orientation 5 degrees. What it will do is we're going to select the subspindle, then we're going to orientate the subspindle to zero degrees, whatever that is, but it's zero degrees. Then it will actually lock the subspindle in that position using this very loud sounding locking pin, and uh, that'll be like physically locked in there. So we're going to hit insert, that'll bring it up in MDI on our two lines, and I'm going to hit the go button, and you'll see it rotate and hopefully lock. Okay, so you can see that's quite a violent affair, and I found that sometimes it doesn't want to unlock, so I'll call like a uh, RPM of 1 and unlock at the same time, and usually that's enough to kind of jiggle it out. I think the pin is a little stuck, that's why. Now, this is supposedly our subspindle 0, and what I haven't checked is if this is a repeatable thing. Like, does it always come back to the jaws in this orientation? But we'll worry about that after we crash something. So, now, you can see our square is not square to the ground. It is kind of like tilt, tilted this way, you know, a little bit, like 30 degrees or something, facing that way. Well, it would be cool if it was facing this way, but it's not. So, what we need to do is now orientate our C-axis, zero, so reset the zero, to where the square is actually aligned to our subspindle and its zero orientation. So I'm going to work on that, but that's our current goal. Okay, well I have some fantastic news. So I just jogged the subspindle over our currently cut part. They're both at zero, and from what I can tell, this is aligned uh, perfectly. So that's uh, actually a really good thing. Now there is one issue, and it's going to be probably impossible for me to show you guys. The flat jaw on our three jaw system is way above the part, or it's, it's way closer to our, our part than the corner parts that are these two jaws. So the issue with that is as this clamps, it's clamping at an equal rate, but this is going to hit the part, our top jaw is going to hit the part before the two corners, which uh, may jostle it around at some, at, at, in some way that we would be unfavorable, like either putting a nick in the jaws or uh, bending the stock kind of thing. So it's kind of hard to tell, but the top jaw is very close and the bottom jaws are not. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to show you, but... Um, so I'm going to figure out maybe the best course of action. Uh, I might loosen this up and bring it up, or loosen it up and then clamp it. Uh, loosen it up just so it clamps, but it's able to move this jaw. I'm not too sure, so... I'll kind of figure something out. Alright guys, well it's the next day and uh, I ended up making uh, some modifications to the jaws. I added, uh, where are, they? where are the jaws? Anyways, what did we do with them? Okay, so this is jaw one, which was flat, but I added this step right here to uh, hug the part more. And uh, so I figured that was why I was off. And, uh, yeah, then, uh, I spent a long time last night trying to figure out how to get it aligned, and it wouldn't align, and I was like, what is going on? Nothing makes sense. So, uh, yeah, so, I, uh, took the coax indicator and put it in here, and then, uh, spun the, uh, the chuck, and I was like, oh, I read zero. But if you spin the spindle with the coax indicator, and then you have it read, like, this... It was way out, so that means that this, the center to this, was not aligned to this, which is strange because the stop pins machine just fine, but I'm gonna guess it's because I aligned the jaws properly, because I used an indicator to put those jaws on, and I indicated it to this. So it probably, I probably couldn't see that this was out because I was aligning the jaws as opposed to aligning the spindle, if you will, if that makes any sense. So. To align the subspindle on this thing, you have to take this door off, you just, you know, move it, fancy. And there's these, uh, 
there's a set screw. You take this nut off, and then there's this bolt. And I'm not really sure what this one does, but every time I moved it, it messed me up. So I stopped moving it. I just snugged it up. So you have basically uh, in or out on one, and then the set screw will go in or out in the other direction. The issue comes with the fact that you can adjust the uh, taper too. And uh, I didn't do that originally when I first adjusted it. And I also adjusted it wrong, I guess. Um, so what happens was, what, what I did first was I adjusted this and got that, basically the spindle to read zero to their, our main spindle. And uh, I was like, okay, cool. How do I adjust the taper on this thing? There's a machine flat spot right here. So what I did was I stuck a dial indicator on top of the spindle and then locked the C axis and then swept this back and forth. And then it turns out that this would be low. So I would adjust the screws that are behind this thing. I'd adjust it to zero, and then I would come back, put the coax indicator back in, re-sweep it, and it would be wrong again because when you adjust the back, you're changing the whole dynamic of the thing. So I did that like nine times, basically coax, adjust, and then did the dial indicator on here, adjust the taper, back and forth until basically the uh, the error started to like close basically, and now they're both zeroed out. So. That took a really long time, and for a while I was like, I'm not really sure I'm doing the correct procedure, but it seems to have worked uh, okay, so we're good now. Uh, one of the big pain points was I would tighten the <laughs> the bolts down that actually snug the thing, and then it would move our our uh, our uh, concentricity readout uh, off, or it would make it move. So that was a pain. Okay, so I'm gonna reinstall the jaws and uh, go through the motions again and see if I can get it to line up this time. Okay, I just checked the alignment by loosening up the jaws and just dropping them onto our part and seeing if they snug up, and they do. Uh, what was happening is this rear jaw all the way in the back wouldn't even touch the part because it was so misaligned. So that's uh, super good. So what I'm going to do is try to indicate the jaws in and see if they're squared again, and then we're going to finally continue on to uh, actually programming and the orientation stuff in. Yeah, stuff takes a while. Alright, I'm going to try to explain and show you with one hand what I've been doing. So, these are the jaws I made, obviously. Now, the uh, we're assuming that the uh, length is exactly, like, they're equal uh, between the three when I machine them. So, the CAD file, the way I designed this was I stuck the square spacer in the CAD file in the center of these jaws, and then basically built the jaws around the center. So, the, that means that if you basically indicate them to be the same uh, height on every, on the back side of them, they should be, like, in theory, uh, uh, equal distance to center, if you will. Now, like, obviously, one may have been machined and is, like, a little bit shorter, and then, or one's a little bit longer because of, like, uh, tool wear or whatever. Um, but this is, seems to be the best way to get it to run as close as possible uh, with these kind of like this weird jaw setup I got going on. And uh, yeah, it's better than doing it by eye, and doing it by eye has been destroying jaws. So um, so basically what I do is, uh, this is kind of hard to do with one hand, but... <laughs> Hold on. So, uh, let's start with jaw one. This is jaw one. Fantastic. So what I'm doing is I'm going to sweep. So first of all, the I got a one thou dial indicator. I don't think I need to be more precise than this. Uh, it's it's mag based to the to the collet uh, the collet spindle, and the C axis is locked, so it's not moving. If you have a tenth indicator, you can actually see the C axis trying to hold position. It bounces the indicator, but the, since it's a thou, it doesn't show it. So I think this is uh, rigid enough for what I'm trying to do. So what we're trying to do is get them all to be, all the jaws, perfectly uh, centered like in the CAD file. So first what I'm going to do is find our high spot, which is going to be the center of our, of our uh, jaw here. Then what I'm going to do, okay, so this is number one. I usually start with one. Zero on one, so we'll pick the indicator up. And then what I've been doing is uh, only having the top bolt, there's two bolts for the jaws. Only the top bolt is uh, uh, just slightly snug, and then so you can see that 
when we go to our high spot here, it's practically on zero. So I'll loosen the top and then move it by hand until we hit zero on the high spot and do this for all three jaws. And then one last thing I've been doing for this specific jaw set is aligning the square in the center uh, by eye, and that's kind of the best I can do, and still making sure this reads uh, zero. And um, because the bottom bolts aren't loose, I have the ability to basically kind of shift the, the jaws just slightly so they look on center. Uh, another important thing is I'm doing this while it's clamped in the clamp position, and uh, you want to do this so your jaws are clamping to something that's smaller than the part you're trying to clamp. So if I was, I wouldn't want to clamp my part in here and then tighten it down because when the jaws go to clamp, they'll only clamp that distance. So you won't actually be clamping anything. You need to clamp. You need to set them clamped below the diameter of the thing you're trying to uh, clamp. So, these are probably all set. This is what it looks like unclamped. So you can see a nice uh, large square there, and then when they come together, they're uh, all perfectly aligned, best I could do. So, yeah, that was another good 30 minute process. But that's what I've been doing, uh, and yeah, the poor man's call it Chuck. So, final check is now we can see that the jaws are equally spaced around our part. I know you guys are literally not going to be able to see it, but uh, take my word for it. The jaws appear to be, at least better than before, uh, now uh, perfectly spaced away from our part. So that's a good sign. Okay, so I cut the end off. The reason is we got to cut another one and see where basically C0 is and then kind of line it up from there. Uh, you guys haven't seen this thing cut anything, so I guess we can uh, show that now. So, let's go to Memory. Program's already loaded at 7.99. We're gonna hit the go button. And I'm gonna turn the coolant off for this so I can actually show you. This is pretty good. You gotta be careful with this because <laughs> tool change and then spray coolant all over us. So hold on, stop it right there. This is a finishing. I guess. Probably don't need it, but... Oh, this part's pretty cool. So, the square spacers have like an hourglass uh, center to them, and because uh, I needed that to actually clear the blade tip, and I don't think people know that, but that's a uh, cool feature, I guess. So basically I got this neutral tool holder, and I come in and actually cut that hourglass into this thing. Yeah, for some reason that lead ends a little weird. I was doing these on the mill before with a uh, lollipop end mill. Alright, now it's going to, oh yeah, orientate it to C0, I think. There's our live tool. Very aggressive coolant flow. So I'm going to see, so when it's orientated, it's now C0.
So that's how I do the square on here. It looks a little dirty. So that's how you get the square. Cool stuff. Now we're going to drill and tap. What I want to do is get a 90 degree spot drill and uh, after dr drilling and tapping or probably drill then spot drill, let's put a nice chamfer because the tap, the form tab I'm using actually leaves a burr on the end and it'd be nice to uh, have it nice and chamfered. And that's why I have this uh, backwards facing drill is because when we go to transfer this into the sub, uh, we'll be able to actually put a chamfer on the end of that thread and uh, make them pristine, if you will. But for now, what I'm coming in, I'm just coming in and facing this, this surface after it taps, and that cleans it up a little bit, but that's more for like a test, uh, testing purposes. So it's a uh, 118 degree carbide uh, 564 drill, and it should be 135, but that's uh, just what I had on hand. Because it uh, walks a little on entry, and I think I have it centered as best as I could, but if you guys are going to be able to see this. Uh, not really, so I'm just going to put the coolant on, but uh, imagine it's drilling a hole. So now we have a hole drilled in the center, and then the tap is right here. It's a, a 256 form tap. It actually works really good, but I have to do a... It's basically going to, like, tool change, basically, but obviously it's not going to index the turret. So that's something I probably need to change in the the long run, make it quick. Very cool, rigid tapping. Then it's going to go and uh, face that backside like I was telling you about. Cool. And from here, we're going to stop it. And what we're left with is the part in, uh, well, it's not in anything yet because the X, the uh, spindle's lo not locked, but, so what we're going to do, uh, let's see, we're going to go to, we're going to reset, program, MBI, so we're going to do M43, which basically tells the lathe to go into C-axis mode. Uh, end of block, then we're going to do an uh, G0, which is a rapid, and then we're going to shift C0, and this is to uh, absolute position C0, I think that's what that means. So you can see it's got, it's going to M43 first, which it'll click and make a sound, and then it'll go to rapid to C0. So we're going to check that out. So that is uh, C0. Uh, currently, it is it is a settable thing, so we are able to program this position if we need to. So now, finally, I'm going to mess with these two and see if I can get them to uh, play nice with each other. Okay, so I brought the spindle forward, the sub spindle in orientation uh, zero, and then so this is zero, and then this is C zero, and actually they did line up, like I said yesterday, but now that the jaws are actually in place, it really lined up. So I went ahead and took the uh, the risky uh, plunge, and I clamped it while this was clamped, and then I unclamped the main, and I'm pulling it out with a sub, as you can see, and it looks like it still lines up, so that's a really, really good sign. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm going to unclamp the... Uh, I'm not really sure. I can't remember what it does. See, if I clamp the main, what's going to happen is it's going to pull the bar backwards, and I don't want it to hurt our jaws, but it might do that. But it might do that during the program, and I can't remember if it does. Uh, well, I guess the only way to, to make things work is to just do them. So we're going to clamp the main. Okay, I guess i got to tape it in. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I just clamped the main and it didn't even move out of the jaws, so that's a really good sign. Um, so now what we can do is just unclamp the sub and it should come off pretty easy. Kind of hard to see the control from here. Perfect. Then we'll back our sub out.
Doesn't look like the jaws got any damage on them, so that's a really, really, really good sign. So I think we're clear to continue on with uh, writing the program for this this guy. Excellent! Alright, so let's go over the code for this uh, whole thing, the transfer anyways. Alright, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to part the uh, square spacer uh, just a little bit. We're not going to part it all the way off. Uh, just We're cutting into the spacer just slightly. Um, I don't know if you can see on here. So we're just going to cut kind of like uh, a little bit. We're trying to miss this drilled hole, but this might be too low. Um, so anyways, we're going to part, not all the way off. And then what's going to happen is uh, the sub spindle is going to clamp it's going to do this chip clearing thing, like blow air on the thing. Then it's going to call this uh, sub program, uh, which is a uh, using an M98. I just learned about these the other day, so bear with me. Basically, it's going to go into memory and pull up 00998, or program uh, 00998. And 0998 is, uh, is basically the is a program written to bring the subspindle and orientate itself. Remember I told you it's got to go to that second home position? So rather than writing all the code here, you can just M98 and call that, that program. In that program, uh, before the M99, and the M99 is the last line in the subprogram, which tells it to go back to the main program. Before the M99 in the subprogram, I've made sure to call a G54 because to get the subspindle to its second home position, it's G56 is what I'm calling. And I've noticed that if you call a G56 in a subprogram, it won't, it, uh, it's like modal. So basically then this will think it's in G56 and that's really bad because you have these, uh, 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 I think they're incremental moves is what they're called, or uh, based off of whatever the active work offset is. So that's kind of bad. So M99, after the subprogram calls that M99, it just reads the next line. So M43 is just to tell the spindle to go into C-axis mode. And then we just say C0. For some reason, it spits it out again. It keeps C0. Now the B-axis, which is our subspindle, is going to go in G54.82 inches away uh, from 0 of G54. Then what it's going to do is then move in this distance. And this distance is the the distance it's going to actually uh, move into the part and clamp on uh, using a feed of 40. And then um, we're just going to clamp the sub chuck, which is an M118. And then uh, I just have a safety like a U0 actually just means a X0. So keep the X away from whatever we're doing. So after that, uh, right now we have the, uh, the main is clamped and the sub spindle is now clamped on our part. So we need to unclamp our main spindle, and then we're going to move the subspindle backwards. Remember, it's still chucked. And then we're going to reclamp the main. So now we have the bar basically clamped between the two spindles with a gap in between. Uh, and what I'm then going to do is uh, we need to get it to break the part off because the parting blade I have isn't long enough to fit in between the two spindles. So you can just break it off by twisting it off of the piece of stock. Um, to do that, we need to pull the orientation off of the subspindle. And to do that on here, we gotta select the subspindle, then select the uh, subspindle synchro. I don't know if this is necessarily needed, but the M1110, uh, one of these is needed, so I just put both in, doesn't hurt anything. M113S1, so we're gonna spin the subspindle at a speed of one RPM, and I'm actually gonna go, yeah, that's fine. Um, and the reason is this, the spin, the pin, the lock pin seems to get a little stuck. So this just helps to get it unstuck. M21 will pull that orientation lock pin out of the sub spindle. And then after that, it won't, once this, it knows it's pulled that pin, it'll then do an M113 S100. So then it's going to rotate the sub spindle quite fast. And remember, we're still chucked onto our part that should rip it off of our uh, piece of stock and I just do a dwell for one second. This will then stop Then this will bring The sub spindle back to its home position which in this case is a g59 b0 And then we stop the program and we're just gonna make sure this works 
before continuing on and doing any of the work on the subspindle. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the moment we've been waiting for. It's taken me 30 minutes to get here because I broke a drill, then a tap, and then the parting, and the things, and things weren't going great. So anyways, here we are. So I'm at the part of the program where we're going to move this guy. You can see our part. She's ready to be plucked away. So yeah, I'm going to single block this all, and uh, we're just going to go through it nice and slow. So we just unclamped. Obviously, it's already unplanned. Sorry, I was supposed to not dwell that long, but it's on single block. Cool. So our next line is this uh, M98 I was telling you about. So that's going to go to this program. So see, it just pulled M98 up. And then I got a bunch of words here. But basically, we're going to go with that G56. Then we're going to M55, do all that. It's going to orientate to 300, uh, M300, which is zero degrees. So we're going to do that. So we're moving to that home position, second home reference or whatever. Cool. There's zero. So. And then I got a, a G54 to bring it back to G54. M99 brings us back to the main program. G43 just turned the C-axis on, so it's orientating to zero. Not too fast now. Okay, there's zero. Should be pretty lined up, but we're gonna, like I said, make sure before we go. All right, now this is gonna go to B, zero, and 821 thousandths, so that's in reference to G54, which is uh, up near here somewhere. So it should be right in front of the part. Let me just stop it. We've got 90 thou to go. So there's in front of the part. Now what it's going to do is move to our clamping amount on the part. Okay, and I'm going to double check this. Looks pretty fantastic to me. So now we're going to go ahead and uh, clamp the sub. Okay. We're going to unclamp the main. Okay. And then we're going to move back. Alright, so far so good. We're going to reclamp the main, okay, then we're going to do all this stuff uh, that basically breaks the part off, so I'm going to turn it off a single block to do this. Okay, and we have a part. We did it! There you go. First subspindle transfer of a square spacer. Now that was a lot of work. Uh, so then the program ends somewhere around here, because uh, that's all that's programmed. But in the next uh, installment, or the next, uh, I'm just going to keep filming, but basically what would happen is uh, then we'd come in with our backside tool here and uh, face it, and then we would do that uh, spot drill and put a nice chamfer on that uh, thread there. But uh, yeah, good work everyone. Okay, well, um, <laughs> so it's been like five hours, and uh, I can't seem to get the uh, process correct. Uh, I got pretty far, but what's happening is the jaws are actually uh, collapsing now. They're made out of 4130, and this uh, 174 annealed, I guess, is uh, significantly harder than the jaws, and it's causing them to deform. So, yeah, this is the best I got so far. Okay, well, it's faced on this side, and uh, it's real. You're not gonna be able to see, but the jaws are starting to get deformed. I mean, the parts starting to get deformed, which is telling me that the jaws are deformed. So, I think my plan is I'm actually out of steel, so I can't just cut new ones like I was hoping. Uh, I'm gonna take them out, and then I'm gonna TIG weld some uh, filler rod on there, and hopefully, the act of being welded is a little bit. They're a little bit harder, and. Uh, yeah, so, and then I'm going to remachine the shape in there, 
and I'm going to try like a not as tight shape. The shape that I chose is five thousandths smaller. So if this is a 125 square on both sides, it was 120 uh, square in the jaw. So I'm thinking maybe that was causing it too. Is uh, it's too small, so it's kind of clamping it all weird. And uh, obviously the part is winning uh, as far as uh, like deformation goes, if that's the right word. But yeah, I'm gonna cut the video here because it's already really long, and I uh, want to finally get some videos back out. And uh, yeah, so I'm. I'm going to film me welding and repairing it, but I'm going to cut this video here, like I just said. So, uh, yeah, catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.